another, I, ca I called it um, Inspiration 2. Please take it literally. Um, we have one nice inspiration giving given by the Forest Future Initiatives. Uh, they are one of the guys who intensively take care about future forests. Then we have a lady from Climate, Claire C. We have uh, probably a forest owner. I hope he will show up in time, Max von Herrmann. And then we have another picture. And then we have a short insight from an architect on wooden construction. And finally, I'm very much looking forward to welcome Professor Sascha Peters, running in an innovation agency in materials and somehow <coughs> focused on wood. All inventions about bending wood, about what you ever can imagine what you can do with wood, fiber, lignin, whatever he is going to present this. And then we are having lunch. So, welcome again. Happy that you are here. The weather is still fine, as tomorrow, as this morning indicated. And I'm happy to welcome on stage Björn Kaminski of Future Forest. Uh, they were scheduled to be here in person, but they have their own firms actually running in Berlin. So he asked me to do his remote pitch. Björn, you are hearing me, I guess. You're looking alike with an interested face. Björn, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can okay, you hear Björn. You? Welcome on stage. The stage is yours. Thanks a lot. Um, so you can, yeah, I, I see you can see my, 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 my screen. Um, yeah, hello together. Um, thanks for having me. My name is uh, Björn Kaminski and I'm the co-founder and head of startup innovation of the Future Forest Initiative. Yeah, as you, as you said, um, Ulf, um, I'm very sorry that I can't be on site. Uh, but the last two days uh, we had our very intensive uh, startup boot camp here in Berlin, um, so I couldn't find the, um, the time to jump um, into into the terrain to Woodstock. So I'm very sorry. Um, yeah, but um, <clears throat> I just yeah want to present um, some or give you some information about the Future Forest Initiative. Last year, my colleague Christoph zu Stolberg um, presented um, what we do at the Future Forest Initiative, and today I want to present to you how we do it. Um, so, let's go ahead, slide, um, just in a nutshell, our vision is to create um, a new innovation ecosystem in terms of forestry and climate, um, with one main goal, bringing innovations into market and reality as fast as possible. The structure that we, um, that we chose um, to reach this goal um, is a startup and innovation hub, maybe as you know, uh, the, yeah, the word or a hub is a very common item and a concept in the startup world. Maybe you know um, the DE hubs uh, in big cities like Munich, like Berlin and Hamburg and a lot, uh, a lot of other cities in, in, in Germany um, that, has, um, that have a focus on important startup sectors like fintech and mobility or logistics. logistics. Right now, we are establishing the first sustainable innovation um, hub, so that is how, how we call it. So a sustainable innovation hub with several components and activities. For example, we bring together our network and guests from all over Europe um, at our future forest forum um, together um, that, here, that we have uh, one year. So it's our main conference um, format that we have. And one of our key activities is our startup accelerator program that I present you later. Um, so the next slide, um, because as we call it, sustainable innovation hub, up, um, of course, our approach, our approach is uh, very impact-driven um, for us, for us, and are a very huge symbol for climate change because we see so much damages and defore deforestation worldwide, but also in Germany, like in the Hartz region, uh, for example, where we are based. So we are based in Blankenburg, um, yeah, near to the Hartz. Um, but climate change isn't the only challenge that we have. And therefore, we identified um, yeah, this year three challenges that um, have a really negative impact on our nature. And for us, it's biodiversity, 
loss, its unsustainable land use, and of course, climate change. And with our accelerator program, we want to find solutions for those challenges and therefore classify our startups um, then in three solution pillars. Um, so the first one is ecosystem services, second climate solutions and smart forestry. And all of our startups are yeah, classified in, in these three pillars um, with yeah, different in, um, innovation fields that we identified. So that's our Let's, let's say main sustainable approach that we have um, as a base and um, yeah, on, on this base we uh, create um, our, our accelerator programs um, that I um, <clears throat> want to present you now. So um, yeah, some words about our accelerator program. We structure our activities in three pillars uh, with different objectives. So the long-term goal is that we have is to invest in startups that we are supporting in our accelerator programs. So we have these three pillars, but the, the main goal is on the on the right side is that we um, build up an own investment vehicle um, to uh, yeah to to, to 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 get the chance to invest um, as well in startups because as as you know startups <clears throat> need a lot of investments to bring their um, solutions into market. So um, <clears throat> this year we focus. Um, on, on the pillar um, in the middle um, of, of the chart that you can see. So that's our core acceleration program. Um, and for this program, uh, we got around 50 applications this year from all over Europe and one from Chile. Um, and finally chose 14 startups that we right now support with different activities. And um, so um, on this chart, you can see um, that we have um, <clears throat> separated our program in two phases. In the first phase, called Validation Sprint, we matched our startups with mentors from our network and organized workshops, input, inputs, and connecting events in order to bring um, our startups in touch with our community. And in the second phase uh, that we started in the last weeks, we focus on developing different kind, so it's too fast, uh, different kind of pilot projects together with the startups um, to get, in best case, a product market fit for their solutions. And the program then ends at the Future Forest Forum in September um, yeah, as our demo day. So just, um, I have just one more slide. Um, just in a nutshell, the, the accelerator program won't be the only innovation program that we, that we want to build up. Uh, right now we are working on other opportunities for our target groups like forest owners, for example. Um, and yeah, and for example, we will offer um, we call it company building process for challenges where we can't find solutions in our startup network. And if you have, if you have, therefore I want to just to present it in neutral. If you have questions about this program that we built up right now, um, then please drop me an email, and I can, of course, give you more information, more detailed information about that, uh, maybe in an in a, in a online call if you want. So I guess that's that could be um, an interesting process. Um, for for companies um, that are working in the forestry sector um, and as well as um, for, for forest owners. So um, that was, was it from my side. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and thanks a lot. And hopefully we are going to see us in September at our future forest forum. You can see on the next slide um, my contact detail information and um, some links. Um, so it would be really nice if you can see in person at our forum at Blankenburg, at Castle Blankenburg in Blankenburg. So it's, uh, our forum is um, from the 8th of and uh, from the 8th to the 9th of September. Thanks a lot. And yeah, that was it from my side. OK, have Bjorn, a nice day. thank you very much. <laughs> Ulrike from Climate Archive. Hi, um, good day. It's no longer morning. Um, so my name is Ulrike Linnik. I work for um, EIT Climate Kick. And I was actually thinking this morning how really unusual it is to be in a, at an event where you have this great variety of things. So you have, um, you have startups, you have researchers, uh, you have um, all kinds of weird and wonderful uh, things. And I really learned a lot. So thank you all for setting this up. It's been really fun. Um, I'm going to talk about our Climate Smart Forest Economy Program. Um, so we are one of these more high-level, maybe slightly strange bureaucratic beasts. We are an EU-funded innovation agency. 
And in the past, we have funded innovation programs, and we have funded startups, we've run accelerator programs, and we still do all of these things. But we are now increasingly starting to um, work on systemic change. So for example, we run the EU mission for cities. This is a program where 130 cities in Europe want to become net zero by 2030. And uh, as a resident of Berlin, which just um, said we're not doing this, uh, 2030 is too close, uh, it's been a bit painful. Um, but we're trying to do this for European cities, we're also trying to do it for um, roughly 100 European regions. And like another area we're working on is, um, is forestry and cities. So we actually believe in order to change this crisis, a climate crisis, that we need to work across forests and cities, and we need to change the relationship between them. So we cannot look at them separately. Uh, so that's the first, um, that's, um, the first thing that it, we think is really, really important. Um, and we believe that the solution to this is creating a holistic system, and we're calling this climate smart forest economy product. So the products need to be climate smart and supporting the forest. The forest is at the heart of everything we do, and everything we do, all these products we are, um, we are supporting need to be supporting the forest. Um, so they need to benefit the forest. Uh, and I think you've heard this um, in some of the other speeches this morning. Uh, so also it's about maximizing the sink benefits, the storage benefits, and also the substitution benefits. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do here. And for this, we have set up a program, and it's called Climate Smart Econ uh, Forest Economy Program, a bit of a mouthful. It's now been running for two and a half years. It's funded by the Good Energies Foundation, and we run it together with our um, partner, Stahlberg. Um, and we are now going into the next phase. So we're looking, uh, and, um, and maybe to maybe give you a bit of an idea of what it is we do in this program. So we have a number of breakthrough initiatives. The focus so far has really been on the Global South. Um, we have some projects in Germany, like um, Bauhütte 4.0. Um, that's all about setting up a value uh, chain that supports um, low-cost housing in Berlin. And it has links to a Tegel project in Schumacher Quartier. Um, so, but the three areas that we want to focus on our work is, first is, how do you create alliances across the value chain? Because again, we think you need to look at the products, you need to look at their, um, where they come from, where the wood is coming from, how far it is transported, and you also need to look at the impact on the biodiversity um, your products have, and then you also need to look at how long um, do these products last, uh, can you recycle them easily, how do you reuse them? So that is, so we're building these regional alliances and anybody who's here and is interested in this kind of area and is also interested in working out of, outside of Germany, please uh, come and talk to me. Then the second type of area of work is science-based tools. And here there's a bit of a link to the work um, that, um, that Konstantin is doing from TEU Munich, who also are a climate kick partner. It's about how do you actually measure it? How do you actually know what is the climate impact? And not just how much, what is the carbon impact, but also um, impact on the water table, on biodiversity, etc. Uh, so we have three tools. One is the 3S framework, and the other one is called the Safeguards Checklist. If you're interested, have a look on the website, just type the name in Google. And, 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 and try them out. We're always really happy to get feedback. And again, I'd be really happy to talk to you uh, in the break. And then the last one is um, expanding a global digital knowledge base. This is in its infancy. Um, we believe that is something that is really uh, lacking and something we're working on. Um, so here's some of our partners. Um, and it would be lovely to um, add a few logos from uh, any of you in the room here. Um, so thank you for listening, and I really look forward to talking to you later.
Thank you. Uh, next presenter will be uh, Giolisi, Alexander Hart. Hey everybody, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm the CEO of Geolize and I would like to talk to you today about our venture. We've heard a lot about data so far and I would like to talk to you about how Geolizer can create data and insights for you as a forest owner. Our mission as Geolizer is to provide forest owners with scalable and actionable insights. We are doing that to enable active forest management and how do we do that? With precision remote sensing and AI. Quickly, I'm here as part of a broader team, so I wanted to quickly talk to the, what the team is. Uh, we have three technical uh, people on the team. We have two founders, Jan Patrick and Dr. Jan Lehmann. Both of them have combined about 20 years of experience in geoinformatics. Uh, then we have Violetta Leon, who is a developer on machine learning. And then we have two people here. We have me as a CEO and then Fritz Timmermans sitting over there as an advisor. Now, what does Geolizer do or how do we do it? There are three steps to the overall process. First of all, we gather forest data at scale. We do that by, by using drones, LiDAR, and multispectral technology. So this enables us to gather insights at scale for large forests. Secondly, now we have terabytes of data, what do we do with that data? We use machine learning, such as uh, deep learning and other machine learning techniques to automatically analyze this data. And lastly, we combine this pre-analyzed data with our expertise in order to generate insights. For, for example, these three use cases you can see here, timber inventory mapping, preventative tree care, or conservation. Another use case that popped up quite a bit today is, of course, also forest fires and the insurance case. How do we do that? A little bit more detail here. We are able to cover more than 500 hectares of forest per day. We're doing that by using a drone you can see here. That's one of those examples that enables us to cover large swaths of wood. In addition, again, as I said, we're using, we're using camera technology in order to gather signals. This enables us to do a few different use cases, such as forest health or the automatic detection of trees. Through the years, we have built uh, a technology advantage uh, that enables us to do these things, and there's four pillars on which this stands. On the one hand, we're using modern drone platforms in order to gather the data, and with those, we're using sensor technologies such as multispectral cameras and LiDAR technology. We are using low-level code to be able to process terabytes of data and make it manageable and analyzable. And lastly, we're using deep learning and other machine learning techniques with over a decade of data and experience we have looked now into how we do this. Uh, there are, to make it a little bit come to life, there are three potential use cases we have been looking into so far. The timber inventory mapping allows you to map your individual trees, species, size, to understand the availability of your timber resources. Another use case is a preventative tree care. So this is looking into identifying individual tree health and looking, for example, into infestations such as the tree beetle and prevent its spread. And lastly, it's a conservation use case, looking into how we can use remote sensing and understanding our forests in order to meet our conservation goals. So why am I here talking to you today? I'm here to talk with you about co-creation. We are currently looking for co-creation partners to collaborate with, to closely partner and develop our insights platform further. We're trying to develop the platform in a way that it solves real problems of forest owners. What are the benefits for you? The benefits are that you get to influence the final product and you get to work with us on shaping uh, and accessing cutting edge technology. For us, this is all about building the right product that solves the right problems in the right way. So <clears throat> the goal of the co-creation is for us to identify the relevant insights that allow you to optimize your sustainable forest management and, and optimize the profitable returns of your forest. What we would do in order to do, get that co-creation started is we would start up the co-creation agreement and a partnership. Then we would spend some time deeply understanding your needs, your operations, your people. And lastly, we would generate together actionable insights and interventions for your forest. 
Uh, what does it look like in detail? There are four steps to the co-creation. We'll do a kickoff where we define common goals together. We'll do in-depth interviews to understand your needs, your questions, your operations. We'll come on site with a drone to gather the data and generate the insights. And lastly, there's an ongoing improvement cycle where we would further hone our insights and the platform. If this sounds interesting to you, please approach me or Fritz Timmermans any time after this presentation. Thank you for your time. So hello, my name is Iris Ulschläger and I'm from Daimler Ulschläger Architekten. Today I show you a project uh, we did in Finnish in two, uh, 2020, which is called the Quartier Weissensee, which is a, um, a neighborhood um, for affordable living. And it also won uh, a prize of environment and uh, building um, of the uh, German federal state. Um, we are an architectural office based in Berlin, and since 25 years we are specialized on um, uh, energy efficiency and uh, also with wood construction, uh, mainly uh, with uh, living um, uh, buildings uh, as the main, as our main source. Um, the Quartier Weissensee is in the north of Berlin in a, a rather diverse area. Uh, and one of the things we did was uh, to, to, to do a very dense um, uh, urban quarter there with four to five story high buildings. And uh, we set two courts, one which was a more public court and one a more private court. And uh, around the five buildings. Um, the idea is uh, a mixed uh, buildings of uh, ownerships, which is the long one at the end, and for, for a co cooperative um, um, a building, um, the four in the middle. And also there's a programmatic organization uh, in the ground floor with restaurant, with a swimming pool, uh, a kindergarten, to get um, some social um, events, which were shared from all of them. And uh, also, we did in the co for cooperative building, we did a mixture of cluster living and uh, just normal rental living. Um, the idea is also to work on sufficiency. We think we have to look at how much space we do use um, by living and in the general living area per person in Germany in 2021 was 47 square meters. And uh, in the cooperative uh, houses we did, uh, we managed about uh, a little bit less than 32 square meters. And we mixed, we mixed in the houses um, the uh, cluster units and the normal uh, units, um, so there wouldn't be one house which only uh, for the clusters. The clusters is um, for a social, um, uh, social people uh, rented, so the minimizing the um, personal living and then um, uh, sharing the communal space. Uh, at, at the end, it was about 66 rental flats and then 10 cluster units. And then the structure. We have a wood uh, uh, mixed uh, uh, building. So the core, the stair core is in concrete and also the basement is in concrete. We also have car, um, basement, uh, all of this is in concrete. But the main structure is in, in wood. So we have a, um, a CLT wood slabs and a, a wood um, structure from, um, of beam, beams and columns and a non durable facade in the front. The idea is to go over all of the five houses with the same structure and to repeat um, the, the same systems like the windows uh, and um, the structure sizes uh, which are repeated to make it also affordable. 
And inside, because we have this mixed use, we did an, uh, a light structure uh, inside of walls, plaster walls, which are easily also to be changeable and as a reaction on different, uh, different needs of the clients and might also be changed in, uh, in times um, like, uh, we don't know how things will change in 20 or 30 years. Um, and then finished, um, our intention was to show, to show the, the wooden structure so you can see it from inside as much as possible and as much as fire protection also allows us. Um, from the outside, we um, strengthen the emphasize the, um, the the uses the communal uses uh, with red uh, spaces, the red uh, colors, and um, also the private spaces was uh, limited and, and showed as a barrier with a white steel structure, which could also be used for greenery. So. That was our practical example of wood construction uh, in Berlin. Thank you. Thanks, Iris. It was quite inspiring, so uh, you fulfilled the meaning of this panel, inspiration. What's, what's possible, what's feasible with wood, especially. Sascha, your turn. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and the possibility to uh, to talk to you. Uh, you gave me six, or you give me six minutes, so I, I brought six materials uh, with me to present. Um, we are um, Old Innovation from uh, Berlin. Um, uh, we are an innovation agency looking for um, sustainable materials, but also for others. We have a, a, a focus on. Um, materials that we can use in the interior and in furniture, so we are um, most of the time uh, wood base. Um, um, to introduce um, what we have learned from the past is that we have to change our system into a circular one. We know that all uh, from our linear perspective, when we, where we take resources make something and throw them back. Um, we have the, the biological circle and the technological circle, technological for the, the ordinary plastics and the, the um, energy intensive materials and uh, the natural, uh, the biological circles for all materials that are natural and we should keep them natural. So thanks a lot, Ion, for your uh, presentation. Um, so uh, we call them biocircular materials, by the way, the biodegradable ones. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, I, I've learned that from the past months because uh, in the naming, there's quite a change now taking place. So um, what we found out, I, I have six materials from six startup uh, companies with me today, uh, and I also got samples from them. Um, I would love to start with that one that's um, from um, a startup called Daika from Israel. They use, um, uh, to, to make boards, they used waste um, wood fibers, and they are able to bring and bind all together with a natural binder. They don't say what it is. It's sort of like a fatty surface, so it's not like this MDF plate, where, where, what takes humidity out of your skin, so it, it, it feels like a, a fatty something inside, but I don't know exactly how they um, manage to do so, but that's interesting. They say there's no plastic inside and it's returnable into nature, so it's biodegradable under normal circumstances, like what you have. Uh, the other one is uh, a startup from Spain, I think they are in the third phase of the, uh, this startup uh, um, development uh, after having a first pilot pr production south of Barcelona. Um, they are, by the way, able to use the pulp of paper mills, which are not 
possible anymore to make paper from because the fibers are too small. But it's possible to make a board from it. This board is 100% made from these fibers, which are too short to make paper from, uh, and they bind it with enzymes. I don't know exactly how this works, but that's very interesting because it's also biodegradable. Um, they have sort of like um, um, a wet pro production process in, and they are situated next to the paper mill because the paper mill pays a lot to bring these two shortened fibers um, back to store it somewhere. Normally it's burned, uh, actually, uh, and this company is doing something with it. So every single production facility they are going to set up should be next to a paper mill, and we have quite a lot. So in Finland, Sweden, also in Germany, keeping uh, contact with them. Next one. We found a company, uh, it's a startup company from ATH Zurich, uh, um, um, which recently started their pilot, pilot production. Um, this board is not made from um, wood, it's made from coconuts, the husk from co the coconuts. When you ever have been to Thailand or Malaysia or Singapore, you see a lot of these coconuts husks um, around the streets. Um, they are, so they, uh, you, you take the coconuts out of the husk and then the husks are just thrown away. So they found a way to combine the coconut fibers, the husk fibers, with uh, tannin, which you also can find in the husk, but also in the, in the bark of trees, uh, and produce um, a board from it. 100% bio-based, 100% biodegradable. I think they don't, uh, so, so they, they can't be produced thinner because it reacts a little bit on humidity and then it swallows, um, but good enough to see. This is, the, um, I think, a little bit, um, a little bit bigger. This is the maximum size they could produce with their pilot um, facility now. Yeah, and they, they have different kind of uh, qualities from uh, reaching from, uh, ranging from MDF to uh, LDF, uh, when I understood it right. And the production is taking place in, uh, on the Philippines where you have the, the husks uh, around. Yeah, this is my, um, uh, my personal favorite because I follow this guy from I, I don't know, from 2012, we found him, um, uh, um, a designer, Eric de Laurence, who studied at the Royal College of Art in London and found out that uh, in these little tiny things called fish scales, you have them all around the world uh, because you have to take the fish scales from um, the fish to make food from it. Um, you have a biopolymer, I think it's keratin, um, and when you push it or press it under, under um, heat, you can create a solid material from it. This is like a stone-like material. It's sensitive to uh, humidity, so you have to protect it a little bit, so it's like MDF, but you can uh, um, easily combine it with wood um, and do furniture from it or interior design it's maybe not the best uh, choice to use it in kitchen and bathroom because of the humidity. So you, you need to protect it. And we don't want to protect it with uh, these ordinary coatings because we want to have this biocircular quality. Then it's this. Uh, we found it recently. This is a startup company maybe in the early phase. Uh, they are starting to, uh, to find um, fundings. Um, from Rotterdam. This is not made from wood, it's made from algae. They use a binding quality of the algae, which uh, um, um, a component which is called uh, alginate to, to bind everything together. This is 100% made from algae. And by the way, algae store CO2 uh, in a very, very good way. And algae grow everywhere uh, in the sea, three dimensional. 
this is maybe one of the best resources we have to, to create a, a carbon neutral uh, society. Yeah, and for interior uh, furniture, they are just at the starting point to, to, create, uh, uh, um, to, to create business. Yeah, and the last one from Sweden, also a startup company. They started two years ago, by the way, and they have a pilot production northwest of uh, Gothenburg. Um, it's not made from wood, it's made from pi paper, paper leaves, hundreds maybe, and they press it so hard and stiff that they create, a, it's a, like a, a strong, like reinforced plastics. It's like maybe a, a metal alternative to uh, aluminium. 100% made from paper, no uh, petrochemicals inside, no synthetic binders. I don't know exactly what they do, <laughs> they don't tell, but <laughs> so I think they are also looking for investors. Uh, yeah, uh, we have a skateboard, uh, or we, we had a skateboard which we sent to an exhibition in Italy uh, that's uh, taking place next week. Um, very interesting, and they, they work for Polestar, for the Volvo uh, electric vehicle doing the interior for them. Very, very interesting company to invest. Yeah, if you like to know more about materials and ideas and uh, um, these crazy startup companies, we do research on that, so we don't invest, but we bring these little ideas, these great ideas to companies. Um, we are doing innovation exhibitions. Maybe we see each other on one of the trade shows we are working for. Thanks a lot for your attention. Um, welcome back to our, I, I call it, this afternoon is our cinema afternoon because the majority of our pitches will be remote. As already stated, I'm not very happy with this, but we will work out, but I promise um, that the next time either people are presenting on themselves, moving their asses to Wittstock or not. That's it. And because remote pitches are particular for the presenter and for the audience, useless. As you well have noticed during the breaks, network is all. Networking is all, and um, it was nice to have these possibilities during Corona time, but now please meet up in person again. But nevertheless, people have become lazy and feel comfortable of presenting remotely. So for this time, thanks to Rosengrün, by the way, to the agency, PR agency, they did a marvelous job. Um, coordinating all this not very obedient presenters. Say that's it. But this is the life of organizing events with human beings. The difference is if you're running a kindergarten, uh, you're shouting at the kids and they are listening to you. If you shout at these guys, nothing will happen. And this is the mere difference between the kindergarten and the so called professionals. But beyond this, they're all the same, I swear you. Independent of age, by the way. Yeah, we do welcome Fred van Beuningen. He is representing Chrysalix Venture Capital, telling us about investing in sustainability technologies. Fred? Yeah, there you are. Okay. I am. Good afternoon. Okay, good afternoon, Fred. You're live. The stage is yours. Ooh, there we go. Shall I, uh, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for having me, even uh, remotely. 
um, to the organizers, of course, Leonard Ventures and, uh, and Swiss Chrono. Much appreciated this opportunity. I, I heard uh, just the last few words of your intro, but I think um, the intent or my intent was to share a few thoughts around uh, investing in circularity um, or in sustainability in general. And I believe I can share my screen. Eh? I prepared a few slides to support the uh, narrative. Is that okay? Excellent. Do that. There we go. Let's put it on uh, and then we'll get it. No further ado. So uh, by means of ultra short introduction, I'm um, um, the managing partner of Chryslex. We are a a venture capital firm with 20 years of experience in clean tech and, and industrial sustainability investing. Um, I'm sitting here actually in our office at the University in Delft, the Technical University in uh, Delft, in a, I can't show you obviously, but in a fully circular office, meaning uh, uh, pulp, pressed pulp fibers, uh, chairs, uh, bamboo table, uh, recycled fishing nets on the, on the floor. Uh, VOC free paint, obviously, and even the soft fabric uh, of the bench is uh, is recycled material. And the office chairs are from a take back scheme. <clears throat> so <clears throat> just to walk the talk a little bit. So let's dive into it because I, I realize we have limited time. So uh, literally yesterday we launched our, we closed our new fund, uh, which will uh, focus on supporting uh, carbon neutral uh, strategies. Uh, of uh, so-called hard to abate sectors, um, and, and you see those sectors here. No doubt uh, for this audience, it is well known that uh, that carbon neutrality has fast become uh, an important trend, uh, strategic actually. 84 uh, of the world largest 100 companies as measured by the MSCI index have announced carbon neutrality. So there will be um, a shift, uh, obviously portfolio shifts, decarbonizing existing assets, new product opportunities, and, uh, and, and also look at the molecule as, as something useful actually to convert into product. And, um, and our belief is that that will require industry collaboration and the forestry and, and pulp and paper industry is certainly part of that whole equation of, of sort of uh, decarbonizing industry. Specifically to circular, um, I, I assume also known in, in this audience that uh, uh, an estimated 50% or even 56% of the EU uh, emission reductions target can be achieved by circularity. This is work, excellent work of Systemic, the London-based consultancy. And for us, um, circularity has fast become a, an important theme because, and, and this is also meant, and in the interest of time, to take a a little bit of a shortcut, maybe a little bit provocative, but it's 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 nice to have a target of carbon neutrality by 2050. But uh, but my statement is often: if you want to be carbon neutral by 2050, you need to be carbon negative by 2030. Um, and this is, has, of course, to do with the legacy assets that will still continue to emit, which means that not only there is limited time. Uh, but also that uh, that uh, carbon removal and negative emission technologies, often nature-based, will become part of the equation and part of the strategies uh, going uh, forward. So, so there's a, there's an urgency around this whole uh, whole uh, issue. Um, busy slide, I appreciate that, but I didn't change it for this presentation because it's just meant to give you an overview of uh, because we'll we'll drill down a little bit on circularity. But it's uh, meant to give you an overview of the, the key technologies that we have, have identified to, to achieve carbon neutrality for these uh, so-called hard to abate sectors. And uh, I hope you can all see it uh, relatively well. Um, but, um, but just the, the very quick summary, efficiency is still important. Alternative fuels, hydrogen, of course, is a, is a big topic in there, but also biofuels. The whole uh, area around material substitution, which for this conference I think is, is relevant, of course, the, the whole substitution of plastics. Circularity, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in the few minutes that we have. Um, actually, carbon as a resource could also be seen as a form of circularity since you would take waste 
carbon from uh, waste from the emissions, which you could could define as a sort of a waste that you put to to use. And then, as I mentioned, the whole area of negative emission technologies and and carbon removal solutions that is fast maturing, and is of course very connected to the carbon markets to have uh, credits uh, as a result of those investments and those uh, projects. So that's the, the very quick overview of uh, of the technology levers, if you want. We then go, uh, just allow me one example, a little bit outside of the, the conference theme, and then we'll, we'll return quickly to, uh, to wood and, and, and pulp and paper. But the reason I show this is because you, you uh, to, to effectively design these strategies to decarbonize, you, you really have to go, of course, one level deeper than the overall summary that you saw. And particularly for mining, um, the, the, the mining sector, in spite of what ESG and financial institutions may hope for, these sectors will not go away. On the contrary, they will grow. So the realistic option is to decouple their emissions from their activities. And then circularity for this industry, for example, is, is a very um, interesting direction. We don't have time to explore the examples today, but we have already invested in several companies that uh, that play in the broader theme of uh, waste to value and, and metals recycling. Um, so, and as a last point, I think uh, for consideration for, for, for you, if you start to think about uh, circularity or, or waste to value, I, I want to broaden that definition a little bit, uh, waste to value, um, in an industrial context, then there are many things to consider. And what we typically do is we, we construct frameworks to, to sort of evaluate opportunities. And it requires, uh, if somebody is chasing me for time, that's fine. Uh, just to <laughs> just tell me one minute or two minutes, then I'll, I'll just do that. Is that the case or just to check? We're still fine? OK, I'll, I'll keep the pace. Um, uh, we are, st we are still make... fine, Fred, but don't exaggerate. No, 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 I, I will not. So, uh, I promise. Um, so, but it's just, I think, to communicate to you that, uh, that re to, to responsibly invest in, in circularity and waste to value, you need to consider many uh, operational variables and, and it needs to be done with a, with a certain appreciation of the technology, obviously, and the cost and, and, and technology uh, challenges. So coming to, and this is my before last uh, slide, coming to, uh, to biomass or, or, or forestry, paper and pulp. Obviously, uh, I, 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 this is an expert conference, so I do need to explain that in how, how general pretreatment works and, and that, uh, that uh, how, how cellulosic components can be transferred into, uh, into sugars and that there are process limiting components like furfural and, and leading to a variety of processing uh, challenges and um, and that there are startups that are more focusing on the uh, on let's say the the the, 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 the conversion of of, uh, of separation of biomass and others that that go direct to to products like uh, like uh, chemicals so for us this is uh, an interesting area also in the uh, in the waste to value uh, uh, sort of category and of course, there are many startups uh, working on, on interesting things. Uh, just just a, a sample of, of those uh, uh, doing different things. Of course, I, I assume that most of these companies are, are known to you. Uh, perhaps if I would have to single out one for, for this limited time, maybe uh, Jiangji, because it's a, it's a sort of a platform with, with machinery and products. And that for the scale up could be, uh, could be an interesting, uh, interesting concept. And the last point I, I would like to make is, so, so yes, we will uh, invest, uh, but circular business models require uh, a very thorough analysis of or the upcycling opportunity, the cost to value, uh, uh, and, and the fundamental economics. The last point I would like to make is that, uh, that while, on the one hand, the demand for pulp and paper-based products, and in particularly packaging, is expected to, to, to grow, of course, and to grow aggressively. It may even outgrow the supply uh, with, with the concerns around defore deforestation. And this, uh, and that is my last point, may open up from a venture perspective, may open up also the opportunity for, for pulping of non-wood uh, fibers uh, from agricultural or industrial uh, crops uh, or, or naturally growing plants. 
and that that is also an area that we are um, um, sort of looking at. But of course, the the, the morphological and, and chemical properties of those fibers will heavily determine in which applications they can be uh, successful. Last word, circular economy, tremendously important uh, area. We have also invested in concrete. Uh, it's a bold one, but in concrete recycling. And and yeah, and, and I uh, I think it's it's important to put capital, risk capital in, in that category. And, and again, thank you very much for having me and, and also remotely. And I hope it was uh, somewhat useful and, and can lead to some further discussion for the conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Fred. Mr. Scroy. Okay, yeah, so thank you very much. The sound is, is working? Fine, thank you. Yeah, so we have already listened to very disruptive, sustainable technical procedures, which we are um, supporting. My name is Silvio Scroy. I'm from a small family office here in Berlin, Kurfürstendamm. Uh, the family office O'Neill and uh, Zgroy. Um, we also do have an own small budget where we are going and supporting very convincing and disruptive companies. And, um, but that budget won't really help you out because in general you need much more. You need a factory, you need staff, you, need, you will have a business plan with a, a need um, of, don't know, 20 million, 30 million, or even more. And uh, here I'm working together. I have the mandate from a fund uh, here in Europe, a green fund, which is supporting, in general, each kind of impact. Yeah, that means, do we have really a convincing, ready-to-launch technology? Yeah, that means, ready-to-launch means you don't have only the first prototype, you have even maybe the second and the third prototype where we say, okay, this is now really developed, this has to be successful. No way. Then it's convincing, and then we have a base to work on it. And uh, yeah, just to give you two examples, um, that fund, which is really convincing and very innovative, um, has um, maybe raised in only five days 180 million uh, euro in order to support a program which is revitalization, also revitalisierung of Deutsch, revitalization of forests worldwide. Uh, so uh, that fund is connected to many, many members of the Forbes list that you know, so the, the wealthiest families uh, worldwide. And it's, uh, it's a digital pa uh, platform that means in a few days the cash is together. Uh, so, but in order to, to go there or to, to reach that point, uh, we need, of course, the classical data room. We need the technical feasibility studies, we need a classical business plan, we need a pitch deck, we need a one-pager. Of course, we need before an NDA. My claim NDA period is five years, that means we will be married five years, more or less. And um, yeah, that's it. Um, so what do we support? So classical green infrastructure like hydrogen, Plants is now coming up, wind farms, of course, solar parks, biogas, power stations, and in general, disruptive technologies. Another client from me, uh, it's a spin-off from a university from Australia. What they, they did, uh, developed a new technical, technical procedure in order to produce an element, a metal, which I'm not allowed to tell you, an element that you know, that the industry needs. And usually, till today, if you, if you are producing that element, you have uh, an output of, of toxical stuffs, which are harmful for the environment. And yeah, in that case, they have discovered a new technical procedure which is not harming the environment. Uh, yeah, so cases like, like this one um, are very interesting to us. And um, so that green fund for which I'm working 
um, is also very generous. Generous means usually, uh, so the structure is that you have a rooftop font with a brand, which I'm not allowing you to tell you, but I guess you will know it, that brand. First, I need an NDA. And then you will have your own sub font. This is yours. And you are allowed to use that brand. And uh, right now, if the very strong network, even my network, even I will be able to, to be active, if we will race into your favor, uh, it's starting with a possible 35 million, but I can also talk and tell them, okay, guys, this is too much. Uh, we only need, in order to scalable and so on, we need maybe only 30 million. Yeah, I can talk. Maybe 30 million is not that much. If you say we, we need an own factory, we want to create jobs, the business plan says up to the break even, we need that number, then it's doable. Yeah, but of course, if you will tell me, look, we want also to scalable later on in other countries, and we need even 60 million, 70 million, the more it is, the better it is. So now, what's happening? Um, they only claim a fee in general of 1.3%, right? Or even a bit less, maybe 1.2.5. 1.3 is very generous. What I know from, from other funds, they claim 2.9%, yeah, uh, or even more, and uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, I have some time? No time? <laughs> yeah, so if you will tell me I have really ready to launch product, then uh, please come to me, and I will do a pre-due diligence, and we will need before a, 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 an NDA, and then I will check out, uh, is it really strong enough for the fund or not? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Is Ingo Dahm with us? No. no. These are situations I'm happy that somebody is missing. Um, we now have uh, Max Schierbecker. Where is he? Max? Max? Yes. Landesbeirat Holz. Sounds relevant and important. Tell us how relevant your activities are. The presentation is uh, active and running. Just for okay, cool. Then I will try to start it. Yeah, okay. So, at first and foremost, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Max. I'm a cluster manager at timber construction at the Landesbeirat Holz Berlin Brandenburg, and I want um, to thank the host Swiss Chrono for um, hosting this uh, brilliant event at this location. And thank you to Mr. Leonhard for the moderation and Rosengreen uh, for the organization of this event. And I want to present to you a project of ours which we are um, conducting in Berlin and Brandenburg, which is um, the timber construction cluster. And it's, uh, it's a small hiccup. I don't know if it's uh, working. Ah, OK. Now there's. Uh, so um, basically, now the presentation, there we go. The timber construction cluster is an idea and a project we want to undergo with this association, the Landesbeirat Berlin-Brandenburg, to uh, bring together a lot of stakeholders all uh, across the value chain of the timber construction process. And uh, right now in this association, we have got um, a lot of strong members, uh, Swiss Chrono as well. So um, it's basically from the forestry to the planning to the architecture to the um, uh, construction industry, everything is uh, basically set up to participate from one another. And the cluster we want um, to set up in Berlin and Brandenburg is um, a regional network 
that is um, undergoing the ah there that's establishing regional networks because we want to go uh, and use the strengths of uh, timber in general and we want to have um, connecting uh, stakeholders we want basically to uh, we want to identify uh, structural problems like um, with governmental agencies to um, strengthen uh, the timber um, cluster in Berlin and Brandenburg and timber construction. We want um, to coordinate projects uh, that are focusing on um, building networks in the region and we want to um, establish value chains and the idea is that we have the whole value chain from the forest in Berlin and Brandenburg, so the, the regional forests and regional um, planning, regional construction, and regional processing, and basically the whole value chain from the forest to the industry set up in this manner. And when we are looking at the... When we are looking at the cluster project itself, it's basically um, connecting stakeholders from all over the, the construction and uh, timber and forestry industry so we want to include every stakeholder in the in the process from the um, usual the planning forestry and use wood where it's um, where it's sawn and where it's constructed and usually we um, have an industry spanning network for this for, uh, in the cluster we want to bundle up competence which is a big part of this because we want to build up competence outside of the network and inside of the network and connecting stakeholders that want to build in wood but don't have the competence right now. So um, messaging into the cluster and out of the cluster to gain competence and to connect stakeholders. And the idea is that we want to um, have in the uh, region of Berlin and Brandenburg because you know um, Berlin is an expensive city and they are lacking rooms and flats for people. So we basically want more timber constructions and even constructions that are setting up on um, existing buildings. So redensify the city. We want um, to use re regional timber. So uh, we have got short um, transportation chains and uh, have a higher impact on the sustainability. and. In the last um, section, we want to participate in the sustainable um, building sector to achieve the certain and urgent uh, climate change goals where the building sector is um, still not reaching the targets it, um, it has to reach for basically all the um, sustainability and uh, climate change needs. And I want to thank you for your attention, and I don't know where I have to point this, but it worked somehow. Yeah, it worked somehow. Thank you. Well, working somehow is always a good solution as well. So, uh, yes, our next presenter was with us uh, the last time. He is now with us remote. It's Jonathan Levine from Folia, from US. It's nice to be back, if virtual. I was there in, in, I think, late January and got to be hosted by Ulf and had a really wonderful time. So I'm sorry I can't make it there in person today. So my name is Dr. Jonathan Levine. I'm the CEO of Folia Materials, where we're using sustainable paper as a platform, using our plant-based chemistry and nanoscience to address global problems. We have a patented metal coating, where what we're doing is ionically bonding metal to the fiber surface to actually upgrade the paper to an advanced material that can outperform plastic. We fully virtual outsource manufacturing with standard industrial manufacturing companies as a drop-in solution so that we can manufacture it in industrial volumes and consumer goods pricing. So we're an advanced material, and what we're doing is taking standard paper and standard uh, aqueous metal salts, in this case silver, and what we're doing is actually bonding the silver, the metal, to the cellulosic fiber surface at the molecular scale. So we're strongly ionically bonding these metal particles and then forming nanoparticles. And because they're strongly bonded, it's safe and allowed from a regulatory perspective because we only have ionic silver 
based dissolvement. This was the invention of my CTO, Dr. Teresa Denkovic, for her McGill Chemistry PhD. And we've scaled the manufacturing at existing industrial lines, 1.6 meter coders, for example, without capital modification. So there's never any, any equipment that we need to own and no modification needed. We're using this as a first use case to after a niche $17 billion, you know, a totally immense market, microwave food packaging, which in the end is a forestry market. Right? We're, we're taking forestry products, we're making it into paper, and we're going to go and outcompete plastic. <clears throat> Europe is going to ban single-use plastic. It's going to ban microwave uh, packaging. It's going to, to ban a lot of these plastics. And what's going to happen? Paper has to replace it. Most of the companies in the technology space are going after structural or barrier replacements. This is a challenge. Plastic out is better than, than paper here. It's easier to process, it's lighter weight, it's lower cost. We're providing better food quality using our coating as a consumer experience, because ultimately what drives things is sales of the consumer goods, which our paper is now around. So our paper delivers better microwave food. How do we do that? The metal in our paper catches microwaves heating and crisping the food surface. So a traditional plastic susceptor is aluminum chemical vapor deposited to plastic film, which is now impermeable, and it holds the water and grease up against your microwave food, whether it's chicken nuggets or burritos or whatever. Paper will wick that away. It will soak away that oil and grease. And of course, it's recyclable, unlike most of these plastics. So this provides a crisp outside and a moist inside, and more importantly, grows the revenue of the frozen food companies. So they'll buy more of our paper packaging and more of forestry products. Penny unit financials, and we're patented. So we sell as standard inputs to manufacturing companies, um, large global firms. So we can license our IP to a large chemical manufacturer or toll blender. We can have IBC bulk containers of coating solution delivered to paper packaging companies with coating assets, or we can have coated paper rolls show up for packaging companies with converting assets. We're forming a network of supply chain partners. We never own manufacturing assets, right? We're a materials IP company. We know how to do all of this. We can do all of this, but better to build our IP, our technology into these large uh, billion to $20 billion firms. And then they provide various pieces of the puzzle, barrier coatings, food grade paper, food packaging, microwave formulated food. So this is a channel partner sales strategy where our goal is to build ourselves in to the Selenuses and Amcors and Budamakis of the world. So their sales team and their support team are the ones taking this forward. So I'm actually talking to every single company on this list, uh, all of which are immense national, international firms, with a goal of $2 million in paid pilots in 2023 uh, to implement our technology on their manufacturing lines. So their people are now manufacturing our technology. And of course, we're collecting revenue checks from that in the long run. We have had $800,000 over four contract revenue from Tyson Foods, our anchor client. Right now they're deciding on a $1.25 million pilot. I'll be going there in the next couple of weeks to finalize that. We have a million dollars in revenue we're targeting from each of the chemical paper and packaging companies looking for one to two firms in each. That would give us $2 million in paid pilots leading into supply chain launch in 2024 for these very large you know, million dollar just for our piece of the puzzle kinds of 50 million products. We're materials technology with many use cases. We've had $1.5 million in paid pilots and $3 million in grants just during our market exploration from a lot of very large billion dollar firms all around the world. This grows into a nice healthy business because of course, if we're built into this and these large firms are selling, well, our technology and our materials being sold as well as this becomes a very nice business. Um, we're a team of scientists and entrepreneurs, uh, Columbia, Cornell, MIT, we're raising two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars for a seed round. This will give us the runway to close these enterprise deals, and then with the two million dollars, this allows us to double our team, allowing us to service and work with these companies. Again, two million dollars is our target revenue for the year to work with these companies, and then this would lead into really our longer-term target is these corporates funding the development, these corporates paying us for revenue, and if we're going to take additional financing, our goal is strategic financing from the venture arms of either Mittelstand uh, manufacturing companies, for example, and we're talking to a couple in Austria, uh, right at the german austria border, for example, a, a billion dollar Mittelstand company, um, but equivalently, you know, the, the large paper chemical and large packaging companies all have their own venture arms. And we're much more interested in a few million dollars from them because obviously they bring a lot of expertise and a lot of capabilities along with that. We're, we're talking to 
it's about to be announced, but we're ta- we're, we're working with uh, the largest pulp supplier in the entire world, <laughs> which which some of you in the room know exactly who that is. Uh, but they're a very large international company, so you kind of get the idea of where we're going with all of this. Thank you. Okay. Thank Jonathan. That's more American chewing gum English. Uh, Nova Dishinger. Everybody, I'm not American. I present you my Franconian accent. I came up from Nuremberg to present to you Proxipel. What's the kick about Proxipel? We enable to bring palletization close to the feedstock and closer to the user. So we are shortcutting transport distances. Same issue, okay. So we are addressing challenges which are well known to everybody. It's, no, it's a waste of time to talk about it. There's a need for... Okay. Um, there is a huge available residual biomass distributed all over many countries, especially in Central Europe, which has the potential for many applications in industry, in private homes, and somewhere else. The solution we present to address this challenge is a trailer which fully integrates a full, fully functional processing line to transform mini-scale biomass with a huge humidity into standardized pellets. We started with residual woods and we continue with uh, residuals from grains, from other um, food industry residuals, and we will see further applications in the years to come. The core technical innovation lies within the way how we dry. The process is not much changed, but we integrate it by a factor of five. This is why we are able to bring this line onto a trailer, a line with a capacity of one ton per hour. The various feedstock sources we address enable to open up new markets. The residual wood market is not addressed for palletization yet. Why? The challenges regarding quality standards to, to, um, to, 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 to maintain a standardized quality independent of where you get your feedstock from is a huge challenge. We have a strategic partner, our first round investor who supported us. We have the solution, we have a first installation running, and we will have a, a small series deployed in the field by autumn. Our core activities regarding sales, we are addressing the private market. Our main investor so far addresses municipal markets. We are located in Switzerland. Switzerland is a closed um, shop. Everybody knows each other. This is how we build up the company, how we enter the market, and why we are convinced that we will manage to go abroad as well. We are um, a company which it took some time to grow, to, to found, to get finance, but in the meantime, we're really fully functional and we convince week by week, we get more and more interest and letters of intent. We don't change the capacity offered, so we are convinced that there's a huge market in between big industry and very small activities. So we learn from wood chip production, which is as a farmer, and we look at big industries and we see that the niche in between is tremendous. We don't need space like big industries. We don't need a lot of transport capacity. We need the capacity, but not the distance. So we are really bringing down transport cost. And we are able to ship. So we are not manufacturing ourselves. We are a service company, so we will multiply by training other service organizations, and we source in mechanical design, mechanical assembly, and also mechanical maintenance. Our management team is quite experienced. Richard, a Swiss guy who founded the company. Then it's Thibault, a French e engineer with an expertise in sales. Jean-Yves, another Swiss guy who is the, uh, the, the main technical brain behind everything, and Diana, who is doing communications. We have a supporting team um, coming from various industries, but always around biomass and heat, selling heat, applying heat from low to high temperatures, 
And also, we have an expertise in very high-value chemical residuals. And we learn and see that there's a growing interest to use a pellet as a new geometric standard for whatever type of feedstock. It could be food, could be a chemical-based material which has to be transformed and um, which will open up Mittelstand markets, so where customers cannot afford to invest too much into quality control. But by assigning a standard quality to a pellet from whatever different type of feedstock, this enables new markets. Core business selling such a trailer at the price of roughly 1 million euro, but it's also about leasing and renting, and then it's about collecting waste, connecting to waste collectors in the countryside, in municipalities and along the roadside. And then it's about packaging, distributing and commercializing. And as we bring it close together, the idea is to ramp up trust into the product. People can contribute and see where the feedstock is coming from. We have by today commercially sold one first unit. We are close to closing 10 furthers sales within the next five to six months and we are in final negotiations regarding two units which will be up for lease only. So this brings us to an order book of roughly 30 million euros. Core markets, residuals from agriculture and food industry. Then we have the um, municipal waste which is of very different quality which today and enables us to cash in also on taking in this waste. And then we have everything re um, resulting from supporting foresting companies in bringing value to their small cut. The volume is huge, so just looking at forestry fine cut, we see a, a, a need for 3,000 such trailers all over Europe, so there is no limitation. Our financials are quite strong, also we are a more or less old industry type organization. We are linked to classical industries, but we open up the business model and bring it into the region. And by offering a decentralized approach to conventionally dominated fields by huge industries, we see a huge market opportunity in front of us. We got some awards through our multi-year history, so we are recognized. And at the end of the day, we also have convinced many partners to support us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Norbert. Uh, is somebody from Ast Astrakogel with us? Okay. Hey, Dirk. Hello. You are on. You are live. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello, can I be heard? Yes. 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 The most yes. favorite answer and question is, can you hear me? I can hear you too. <laughs> oh, fine, go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, can you see the screen as well, the presentation? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, thank you very much for the possibility to present here today at this uh, amazing conference. So uh, my name is Dirk Wanich. I'm a part of the team of Aerojadet. Um, this is a company that uh, consists of uh, former BSF employees and a couple of researchers from the Technical University of Hamburg, uh, globally leading in the field that we're working on. And uh, here you can see our mission statement. So our focus is green supermaterials. And what that means, um, I'm going to explain to you in a moment. So first of all, let's see if I can switch this here. Okay. So um, first of all, um, the global pains that we've addressed that we want to that we want to look at. Can you guys uh, do you guys see my next slide? So just to get some feedback because talking here in the room is always a bit tricky. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So. Yes. Um, these are the global pains that we're working on. So a global climate and energy crisis, of course, clear to every one of you. Plastics pollution and raw material availability is meant here. And we want to address this with materials that provide energy efficiency, 
that are based on natural materials and local sources. And uh, our technology of choice, which we've been working on also in the industrial environment for 10 years and more, are so-called aerogels. These are mesoporous materials with a very light, with a very fine pore structure of less than 50 nanometers. Those are interesting as a thermal super installation, but also, for example, as carrier materials and many other applications. Now, why, why should this be interesting uh, in a bio-based format? Um, coming from, from uh, R&D in the construction industry, um, we know that uh, there's, of course, a lot of insulation materials. You know, you will know many of them, uh, lower performance and this mineral glass wool. You go up to EPS, PU foams, and then high performance materials such as silica aerogels or vacuum insulation panels. And what we realized is that, of course, I mean, if you want to, to bring a renewable aspect into this, then all of these materials have no renewable content. Now, there is also renewable materials available. However, these, uh, such as wood fiber insulation boards or cellulose fill and so on, suffer from rather low performance as well. And this is where we see a gap for us as a company to, to um, develop and produce uh, new materials with high performance and also high um, high um, uh, renewable content. And this is a space that is currently unoccupied. Now, uh, thermal insulation is not the only business and we are active in many verticals and I don't have the time to uh, explain all of these uh, here today, but um, you see it here divided into thermal insulation verticals uh, such as construction, cold chain mobility and apparel. Um, but we're also active in areas such as uh, EV. This is a particularly interesting area. This is not for bio aerogels, but uh, there it's about the safety of the batteries. And then fragrances or cosmetics are applications where actually you load something onto a porous material and want to release it, or you modify the rheology of, uh, of a system. And um, on, the, on the X axis here, you see the different products. Um, the first two are the ones that we're de developing now as a new company. Um, the first one are uh, the green materials, um, we have an IP protected formulation platform enabling us to tune the materials according to customer requirements. We also have a, a variant where we uh, can go into high temperature and fire resistant applications. And then on the right, you see two product lines, these blankets here. This is a product from a partner that we sell, it's the best uh, fire class available for construction applications mainly. And then this product here on the right is actually one that we developed at BSF and produced for over 10 years in the team that now transitioned to the new company. And this is a very nice to work with board, which is the best interior insulation that you can buy now. Of course, especially interesting for energetic renovation these days. Yeah, and just to give you a very, very broad overview, please feel free to contact if you're interested in any of this. And uh, maybe what, what may be of particular interest of you is this. Uh, so we gained a lot of uh, um, public and, and uh, feedback from companies on this product, which we um, wrote about in a couple of articles. This is the first super insulating bio aerogel made out of lignin. So we were able to convert lignin into a high performance product, show super insulating properties. So it means that you can actually achieve a much thinner insulation layer. It's still a work in progress. Yeah, so the product is not finished, but um, the properties that you see here are already achieved. And the advantage is that you can then save CO2 from already the green starting material in combination with the energy efficiency during use as an insulation material. And also there's a huge recycling potential for this material because the process has no chemical addition, there's no chemical modifications, it's 100% bio-based. And we're also working on, on materials on, uh, based on other wood raw materials such as cellulose and so on. So there's a huge space that's open there for us um, um, that we're looking into. Yeah, very briefly at a glance, a uh, couple of uh, figures and, and information about the company. So it's from 2021, uh, we're split between Osnabrück and Hamburg. Um, um, as I said, we worked previously for BSF, some of us, and uh, we gained independence from them. And why is this interesting? I mean, at BSF, we worked on this aerogel topic and we were able to acquire the technology from them because they stopped work on this. And uh, our core business is aerogel R&D production and sales. Now, it required a couple of patents from them but also filed a couple of new ones on our new products. Up to now, financing is only self-financed, family and friends. Uh, we, we now uh, started also selling uh, materials and we're raising funding for our first production plants um, to be able to, to fabricate these new products. Uh, production technology is also something that, uh, that we've worked on for a long time and we know how to, to get the prices down for these materials to increase market penetration and it's definitely something that's interesting in this industry. Yeah, we have a large global customer and partner network already from the time before this company. 
Um, that's, this enables us to cover this huge uh, range of different applications and, and locations by not having to do a lot of uh, um, um, marketing and customer acquisition at the moment. So that's a big advantage, of course. And first, supply agreements have been signed. A couple of uh, um, here, a couple of points about the team, maybe. So you see me and my colleague Mark here on the left from BSF, formerly, and then these three guys from the University of Hamburg, who are the real technical experts. And we have also two um, business uh, consultants that help us with contract law and, and funding acquisition and such. And yeah, with that, I'd like to finish. Thank you very much for your attention. And please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kirian. Hello together. Does it work? Yeah. Hello together. Thanks for inviting me to this event. Um, I'm presenting you about uh, RUFAS, which uh, is, uh, will play a role in the future in uh, sustainable cities because the future of cities will be on roofs. But what is the problem? So far, um, uh, when we look into the German market, uh, in Germany we only uh, produce at the moment around 10,000 uh, rooftop apartments at the moment. When you look deeper into this topic, there are a lot of reasons, um, but for example, one reason is uh, 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 apartments of the size or ob objects, projects of the size less than 500 square meters are not really lucrative to architects. It's simply a complicated topic. Second is that nine out of 10 projects fail in the early planning stage already, and people pay money for that. And the third one is, um, Building in stock, so this is what will happen. Building in stock is based on a, on a, on a mineral building and then put a timber building on top of it. It's, that's complicated and we don't have the, the, the skilled labor ship for that. So what we are doing is actually, what we are doing actually is, this is how it looks like. You see on the left a normal building and on the right you will see a building which is kind of the classical rooftop addition. It's not retrofitting, it's really putting a new apartment on top of it. And what we from Rufus are doing is we provide a digital platform to speed up the transformation of rooftop development into living uh, space. So um, important to understand is there is a whole value chain from the, um, you, you, you know you have a roof until you, you contact an architect, until the planning phase, until the construction phase. It's a very fractionate uh, 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 chain. And we from Rufus build a whole chain all together. We only focus on Lego-like um, um, hardware systems. There are different availables. We have already four under contracts. And with this, we can scale up rooftop development projects. Looking into the numbers. So in Germany alone, we have space for 2.4 million living units on top of roofs in the attractive areas. In Berlin alone, at least 80,000. As I said before, only 10,000 are realized in Germany per year and in Berlin around 700, and um, um, when, sorry, um, exactly, and when you look, uh, sorry, I just have a, exactly, so about the team. Um, I'm working together with Felix, he's the tech guy on board. Um, he did develop a dating uh, app 15 years ago with more than 1 million downloads. He, he knows how to do digital and he did not have any investor. Um, since that, he uh, started a solar company in the pre-solar time uh, with a, a revenue of 10 million. And since that, he's a freelancer and you can book him to create your digital um, sales. Um, for example, companies like Douglas or Eurowings booked him, so his apps are creating a billion of revenue per year. So he really knows how to develop digital products. And I'm the construction guy. I, my background is a telco industry. I developed a kind of an app store system, and since seven years I'm in the construction industry. And in the construction industry, I developed now two digital tools. I worked for Wirt, this is the screw billionaire from South Germany. And um, we also, 
uh, also founded and I'm a board member of the Association of Digital Construction. So where are 140 members already organized and we know what's going on in the digital market and how complicated also the construction industry is. So a little bit more about a little bit more about the project. What we will do is we really take the whole value chain and we start now with the uh, roof owners to explain them how to get uh, valuable information about the roof, starting the planning process and then uh, including the prefab and the construction teams to work much better together. To give you an example, to give you an example, architects, for example, at the moment, they plan a lot in a very early stage. This means why nine out of 10 projects fail, because they realize during the process, oh my God, is this complicated? We are in Germany, a lot of bureaucracy is involved and so on. But what we do is we, we kind of autom automate the, the early stage planning until almost until the um, authorization is done by the, by the state. And then we help to understand, so we are using actually um, artificial intelligence to create floor plans. We can improve that, we know exactly what's going on as we are um, organizing and um, orchestrating the whole value chain with digital tools. Oh, this was on, not on purpose. So. Our go-to-market at the moment is we know we need to prove that we can scale winning roof owners. So we uh, have three tools available at the moment, which is roof owner has a roof. He wants to know, is it possible to build on it? He can, we can give him this information free of charge. We are kind of have a guess of 90%. Uh, we can, kind of can, can uh, kind of deliver this quality of our answer. Next one is the roof scanner. No, sorry, it's the roof um, potential analysis. It's an old, it's an old slide. Roof potential analysis, we let the user know what is kind of the, the, the value of his roof, what are the economical backgrounds, what will be the costs, what will be the grants he receives, and he gets the information what he should build on top of his, his roofs, and not just a premium apartment, maybe family living makes sense in certain areas. So, and the roof scanner is something we send, he can order a person, the person goes to the site, he scans the site, he creates a floor plan out of that, and he checks the most important information like static information and uh, fire protection information. And the two projects on the right side, they are premium products, but kind of cheap, compared to when you go to an architect, you will pay much more. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, we are kind of looking very much into sustainable um, construction at the moment uh, because our chance is to build with wood and to make CO2 negative buildings. So, and um, we are looking for money at the moment uh, for 475,000 euro and um, we have already an investor pool committed of 150,000 euro. Thank you. Uh, Julia. Hello, my name is Julian Oldengott. Um, I'm the CEO of Tribitech Magnum Board. We are a producer of the prefabricated uh, timber construction system Magnum Board, which contains several layers um, of the OSB of Swiss Chrono. Um, it is for wall elements, for roof elements, for ceiling elements, um, and if you want to have further impressions, you can also have a look over there. Um, we're building or we're producing uh, Magnum Board since 2011 in Ludwigsfelde, um, south of um, Berlin. And our aim is to use the full potential of wood. So we use mainly um, wood from Brandenburg and um, also the raw material, OSB, is produced in Brandenburg, 
north of Brandenburg, and our company for producing this um, building system is also in Brandenburg. So always short ways and to use the full potential of wood. Um, at the moment, we have an annual capacity uh, about 4,000 cubic meter, what we can produce. And if you calculate it on the basic of uh, single family houses, it would be 100. But of course, we also uh, produce multifamily houses or um, stock building. And um, we are, um, for the next year, we do the extension on our capacity uh, so that we can produce to, uh, 12,000 cubic meter. And this means uh, 300 single family houses. Um, because the time is very short to present, I just give you an um, impression about how to build with magnum board. Yeah? Uh, one project was uh, Grümitz West. Uh, it is uh, north of Germany uh, at the Baltic Sea. And this is a, this is a three level uh, multifamily house. And um, the project developer is Kuschel and Fricke. And here we have the complete house in magnum board. Yeah? So the wall, the ceiling, and the roof elements. Uh, except the staircase, this is uh, still a concrete core, um, but um, for the future projects, the uh, project developer uh, will do it as well in Magnumburg because it's also possible, because we achieve also the fire resistance properties for that. And um, we used here uh, around 250 cubic meter Magnumburg, so this means around 300 tons CO2 storage, which is quite high for this kind of building. And the interesting uh, detail about that uh, is that the project developer built the first time with the timber construction, so before they only built uh, with concrete, so they didn't have any experience with uh, timber. And um, they had uh, their own stuff to assemble the shell construction, and it was just one carpenter and five Ukraine uh, bricklayers. They even couldn't speak German, but uh, still it was possible to build up these houses completely in 37 hours. So this also emphasizes the simplicity and the short assembly time uh, with Magnum board. Uh, um, one detail, uh, interesting details as well, um, that we had this um, cantilevered balcony as an extension uh, of the ceiling and uh, without any columns uh, underneath. And this is uh, possible also with the timber construction system because we don't have any cold bridges. So this would be not possible with the concrete, for example. Um, another interesting detail about this project um, was is um, that there was a high requ uh, requirement of the separation wall between the units. And it was to create a separation wall as thin as possible and with a minimum um, sound isolation value of um, 56 dB. And our solution was one block. This is our own developing between uh, Tribidiak Magnum Board, Kuschel and Fricke, and uh, cooperation with uh, Wolf Bavaria. And there we created um, a separation wall with a sound isolation value of 66 dB, so we even surpass the requirement. And um, the interesting part is that we just have a thickness of 26.5 centimeters, so quite thin for this kind of value. And um, therefore, we also achieved uh, at the Baumesse in uh, Munich um, the Innovation Award for Architecture and Building for this um, separation wall. And um, yeah, this was uh, a detail about this project. Maybe um, to show you uh, a few impressions. It's working, hopefully. Okay. So there you can see um, already the second level of um, magnum board. It was the second day already. There you can see the core of um, concrete. The rest is totally uh, magnum board. Very accurate to a millimeter, the cantilevered balcony. And um, yeah, a very clean construction site. And also the roof, so very solid, so 100 millimeters for the roof. So it's also good for the, to um, not to eat up very easily in the, in, the, in the high level of the apartment. Yeah. 
yeah, now another project in heart of Berlin, the Holzmarkt. Yeah, it's in the center of, of Berlin. Um, the architecture was made by Office Park Schierbach, and it was assembled by the company Arche Naturhaus. And um, is this working? Yes. Um, the start was in um, September 2022 and it will be finished in uh, August 20, uh, this year. And um, the challenge about this project was um, to have a separation wall and um, with a very high load-bearing uh, wall element, which still, still um, uh, surpassed the uh, fire resistance requirements. And this was easily fulfilled with the magnum board because we have a very good um, fire resistance properties because we're still very solid. And uh, for the ground floor, we have uh, 200 millimeters thick wall elements, separation walls. And um, yeah, also to show um, even if it's high challenges or high requirements, you can uh, use as a solution magnum board. So here you can also see um, some pictures about the construction site on the left and how it will uh, finish on the right the Red House, so um, I just can recommend to have a, a beer over there and it's a nice atmosphere there and maybe to see also the nice uh, project of Magnumboard as well. So um, thank you for your attention and also thanks uh, to Swiss Kono for having me here and yes, thank you very much.